Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Our distinguished guest this evening, Joan Didion, is a very rare individual. Uh, I noticed she's a fifth generation Californian who actually moved east to New York City. Um, this makes her quite unique, of course. A native of Sacramento, she received a bachelor's degree from a relatively obscure campus of the University of California, uh, which I'm told is located somewhere on the eastern shores of San Francisco Bay. Her remarkable career as an essayist, novelist, screenwriter has spanned well over three decades. Ms. Didion's fiction includes Run River, Play It As It Lays, A Book of Common Prayer, Democracy, and The Last Thing He Wanted. Her nonfiction includes Slouching Towards Bethlehem, The White Album, Salvador, Miami, and Henry. Ms. Didion's screenplays which she co-authored with her husband, the well-known writer John Gregory Dunn, are also very well known. There's The Panic in Needle Park, which was released in 1971, and then following Play It As It Lays, A Star Is Born, True Confessions, Hills Like White Elephants, and Up Close and Personal. Ms. Didion has lectured at many colleges and universities across the country, including Stanford, Bard, Yale, UCLA, and the Graduate School of Journalism at Columbia University, and oh yes, Berkeley, of course. And in addition to the execution of her many independent writing projects, she's often a regular contributor to the New Yorker magazine and to the New York Review of Books. Ms. Didion's work has garnered many accolades and awards, among them the Edward McDowell Medal in 1996 and the Columbia Journalism Award just a couple of years ago, and most recently, her new book, Political Fictions, received the prestigious George Polk Journalism Award. It is indeed this latest work, Political Fiction, that captures our attention this evening. This collection of essays, first published by Knopf last year, offers a series of penetrating, subversive, often hilarious, and always arresting assessments of recent American political history and of contemporary American political culture. Ms. Didion, it's a great pleasure to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in warmly welcoming someone whose work a critic recently described as the freshest application of an acute literary intelligence to the political scene since Norman Mailer gave up going to demonstrations <laughs> over three decades ago. Now, the focus of these essays in political fictions uh, has, is primarily the last three presidential elections. There are a few other items addressed in these chapters. Uh, and the major theme in your book concerns what you describe as the growing disconnect between the electorate in this country and what you see as a growing permanent uh, political class. Right. I didn't know. I mean, it wasn't called the disconnect by me or anybody else until, until, the, until the year of the impeachment, right? But that's what it, that, that, that was in 1988. That's what we were seeing. I mean, we, we, were, we were seeing the, uh, this political class that was this, mecha this political mechanism, the political process that was so isolated that it, was, that it, was, it, was, it seemed to be designed entirely for it. To, to perpetuate itself, and, and, to, and nobody, it was impenetrable. But it, it's also your, your central argument that this political class, these insiders, these professionals who serve our candidates for office and our political leaders. Oh, right about them. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. uh, they become increasingly obsessed with a shrinking portion of the electorate. Right. Yeah, the, 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 they. Um, I mean, it's it, well, a shrinking portion of the electorate actually votes, and they go after. They they are entirely focused on most likely to vote, and since the most li the people most likely to vote in a say a primary election are people who have an agenda um, and can and and. and and can be organized to get to the polls on the basis of that agenda. It has made a very skewed kind of 
politics. So we have candidates who are not, who, who, are, who, who represent an, a, a very narrow agenda usually, and the rest of the electorate loses interest in the general. I guess this is the foundation of your particularly arresting statement in the book that the notion of choice is one of the great fictions of, our, the central fiction. of our political yeah. system. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is no, with two parties determined to, to, to attract exactly the same voter and to, and to obscure any discernible difference between them uh, themselves, uh, there is no choice. So we then, we then have the Tweedledumlicans and the Tweedledemocrats, mm -hmm. who, uh, mm -hmm. in some sense then... Now, do you notice, do you notice in the whole question recently, I mean, in the past the weeks, the whole question of what people said about what, what, what potential candidates in 2004 said about, the, said about Iraq was always talked about in the papers and on CNN and wherever you encountered it, it was talked about as positioning himself. Um, Kerry was said to be positioning himself. Not, not he might, the, the idea that he might have an honest thought about it. <laughs> uh, Isn't it also true that the, this, this rush for the middle, this, this rush for a kind of, uh, to a kind of blandness yeah. uh, that won't offend for the sake of electoral success, is also characterized by candidates and their staffs becoming obsessed with the kind of outliers in their constituencies. You, you make a point in uh, one of your essays that uh, during the Clinton campaigns, one of the great obsessions of Clinton's staff was to find out what was on the minds of Democrats who had voted for Reagan. Oh, the Reagan Democrats are on everybody's mind. I mean, <laughs> still, I mean, now they're called the swing vote. but. Uh, those, those people are absolutely central to, to political, to the process, and yet, the, and yet they aren't. <laughs> well, and They're you, a very small group of people, really. And then the candidates, in some sense, if I'm reading you correctly, are not really speaking to their core constituencies. No. In fact, may ignore them for long periods no, of no, the no, campaign. No, 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 no. There was something astonishing that I came across when I was doing one of these pieces, which was the head of the DLC, the Democratic Leadership uh, Council, uh, si actually said with pleasure that in the 2000 election we had, uh, finally the parties had achieved parity. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> it means they aren't, means there's no difference between They're not them. distinguishable. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a bit about this issue of uh, voter apathy. You've, you've uh, already mentioned it. The voter participation rate in the United States in national elections is always astonishingly low, mm -hmm. uh, uh, certainly by any global comparison. Yeah. And I wonder to what extent you see this apathy or disengagement as being a direct product of this insider class that you chronicle. I, see, I see it as, 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 as being the product rather than, rather than the cause. I mean, I, I think most people see it as being the cause, uh, you know, we, well, we would, if we voted, if we went out and voted, but if you, I mean, I do go out and vote, uh, but it doesn't do any good. I mean, uh, <laughs> there is, I don't have often find anybody to vote for. I mean, I just do it, like a tick. <laughs> yeah. Well, let, let's talk about voting for a second. Um, there's been a lot of debate uh, in recent years about the mechanisms we have in this country to enable people to vote or to yeah. disable people yeah. from voting in light of the controversies mm -hmm. of the last presidential election. And uh, I wondered, given the work you've done on these essays, what your opinion was of proposals, for example, to allow for registration on election day itself? Well, I think that would be a very good idea. I mean, I mean and all of those, those easy, making registration, simplifying registration, I mean, to register in New York is, takes, takes quite a bit of effort on your part. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, all the motor voter, uh, Proposals, proposals. And, and I think it's. I think it were, I mean, I think it's in 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 action in some states, isn't it? Uh, you can like in Oregon, maybe. Yeah. yeah. And then there's the issue of election day itself. We're the only industrialized nation that uh, for which election day is not a national holiday. Right. Uh, it's a day Tuesday. Of rest. That's a. <laughs> 
first Tuesday in November. Yeah. I mean, I, I know a lot of people, through, actually we had a primary in, in um, yeah, we had we had no, we had we had an election a mayoralty uh, election in in uh, New York on September 11th 2001 and a lot of people I knew uh, my assistant's father was not in the Royal Financial Center because he'd gone out to vote I mean, it was one of those blessings that comes <laughs> to voters <laughs> one of the few mm. well uh, I'm curious, you know, there have been proposals that election day be moved to a Sunday, mm -hmm. that the polls be open for 24 hours. 24 in, hours in would be sensible, venues. yeah. Also, I don't see, I, I, you know, the uh, absentees, um, I, I know it's becoming a problem. I mean, I, the, the, the amount of, uh, they com uh, I saw, I read a bitter complaint about it the other day, the, about the fact that large numbers of people were already going to have voted uh, before, you know, three or four weeks before the uh, election, and so you couldn't, uh, you couldn't throw your television money into your last three or four weeks. I'm not sure that's a bad thing. I mean, uh, the uh, it was fairly easy to vote absentee if you're if you're voting in California. It's quite hard to vote absentee if you're voting in New York. Uh, yeah, it's more rigorously controlled. Yeah. How do you feel about? Uh, th there have been some suggestions by political scientists who observe this process that another difficulty we encounter is the activity of the media on election day, with exit polling. Uh, with efforts to reveal or project results long before the polls have oh, closed. Oh, I know, and you, always, and you always feel, I mean, especially if you live in California, which I've done for most of my life, um, you feel as if it's, o it's over, uh, even if they don't say, you know, they, they, they're all kind of winking at each other, you know what they think. <laughs> you know, you know they, have, they have got the figures, and, 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 it's, uh, and you can kind of tell what they, what they are before the, before that also magic the, moment. The invidious memories of uh, Dukakis conceding before the polls had actually <laughs> yes. even closed in California yeah. and how much that angered uh, the Democratic voters. But would you think it then a sensible proposal that the media be barred from any commentary until the polls have closed? I don't know. I, don't, I, think, I think it's just one of those things we're going to have to live with. Uh, I, don't, I mean, I'm, I'm not against barring, I'm, I'm not into barring the, 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 the media from anything. Uh, but um, the amount of, I'm not sure that they should be allowed to do exit polling at, you know, um, I, I'm not sure anybody, I don't, I'm not sure it's useful for anybody, I mean, once, once, once people have voted, I don't, I don't know if the candidates even need to know. I mean, I would like people to stay away from the polling place. <laughs> Well, let's talk about political campaigning in a, in a little more detail. Uh, you poke a lot of fun at the sort of empty and vacuous statements that emanate from all of our candidates for office and our incumbents as they aggressively seek out this middle ground and try to appeal to these very small proportions of the electorate that they, that they identify as uh, uh, focus groups. And I was curious about, uh, since you've had the opportunity to spend some time with these campaigners on the, on the trail, um, if it's your perception that in many respects, these individuals never have an opportunity to really think through the issues. They don't, they're talking I don't about. think they think through the issues. They th they, oh, the, the, they res their, their, their instinctive or reflexive response to, to an issue is how, how, can I, how can I cover myself on this? How can I not get hurt on this? What, how can I, they think, how can I position, well, how, posi I mean, it's, it, it, it is the way I don't think they have time to think through, especially in the heat of the campaign, if something comes up that hasn't come up before, you know. I recall a, an essay many years back. John Hersey spent a day with President Ford in the White House. He was given the opportunity simply to trail the president all day. It was evidently a relatively normal day. 
but nonetheless an opportunity for a working journalist to see the president at work. And uh, Hersey then produced this very long essay for the New York Times uh, magazine one week. It was the whole issue. And in the middle of this description of the president's day, Hersey pulls up short and says, when does the president think? <laughs> you know, it, it was one meeting after another. It was yeah. rushing hither and yon, yeah. hearing reports from his staff. But there was never a time where the to president was able to sit alone, read, think, yeah. jot some notes, and I mean, formulate I mean, his own ideas. Yeah, I mean, with, I mean the, you see those schedules, and they're all they're all about they're all about op photo opportunities or other kinds of, op of ops. Uh, this is a, this is this is nobody remembers this. I remember it because I was teaching at Berkeley in the spring of '75, and I was all on myself in the faculty club most of the time, and so I was reading all the papers, and and, and, and I, I was mesmerized by the fall of Saigon, and the way the story kept changing, and from edition to edition. I mean, I would run out and get papers every few hours. It seemed to me. President Ford's uh, was at the, every story about the uh, about his reaction to the fall of Saigon was the Dateline Palm Desert. <laughs> <laughs> That's more than frightening. Yes. Well, uh, on the matter of positioning and molding stories. Uh, you have a very, a very powerful chapter in this book, The West Wing of Oz, where you talk in part about the Mazote Massacre mm -hmm. and about the reactions of the Reagan administration to the first news uh, that this massacre may indeed have taken place and in fact might have taken place with uh, uh, knowledge of, of uh, the American uh, foreign relations staff. And you make the point that as the Reagan administration was finally forced to deal with this breaking news, despite its efforts to hold it at arm's length for so long, uh, that President Reagan and his staff were concerned that the nation not suffer from a Vietnam syndrome, not be strong on the matter of insurgents and terrorists, as we would call them today. Do you think the nation has learned anything of substantial value from the Vietnam experience in no. light of what you reported? No, there? I don't think. I think. I think we've we're still there. I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I, the whole idea of getting over this, the, 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 the getting over the Vietnam syndrome by going to war in Grenada uh, always had a flaw in it. You know, it was. Uh, but that was, you know, we tried to do it in Central America. Um, but we never, I mean, th 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 there was a point at which people were talking about the war in El Salvador, the, in, in El Salvador as, as a, a, a perfect model for, 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 for what we failed to do in Vietnam, we could do it here. Um, but that fell apart in in, in, in the end of the second administration and Iran-Contra. Um, well, there always seems to be the focus on means, mm -hmm. but not goals. All right, they couldn't get the money to do that. Right. <laughs> right. And that was part of the Iran-Contra scandal yeah. in, the, in, yeah. the, in the first place. Let's talk a little bit about Ronald Reagan. You spend a fair amount of time uh, in this book talking about Reagan, and in particular, you focus on the work of Dinesh D'Souza, who wrote a uh, kind of primer on Ronald Reagan for, for Americans to learn about what D'Souza described as this, remarkable, uh, as this remarkable leader. And yet you go to great lengths to show that there's virtually no substance to this argument at all. Well, there is no substance to D'Souza's argument. I mean, th th there might be... I mean, I can imagine, although I have never read it, I can imagine an argument uh, that that, that um, Ronald Reagan was, despite whatever his flaws were, a a a a, uh, a good president, a leader of some sort. I can imagine this argument, but I have not that I've read it. But I, but Dinesh D'Souza didn't make that argument. I mean, he was it it, it was it was just really dumb. <laughs> this. Well, I, I, well, 
I share your conviction in that regard. Um, how does one account then for pundits like D'Souza, and there are several of them, he's a very prominent example, who issue these books that, in fact, as we examine them closely, they come apart in our hands. There's no real yeah. foundation to them. But they enjoy all of this attention from the press and from the media when they issue these, these works. Well, there was, a whole, there was a whole bunch of... D'Souza worked in the White House when he was in his early 20s. Um, and there was, at that time, during the first Reagan administration, the, the first term, there, Washington was flooded with children just out of school who um, were determined not to not were determined to to make their own way, and so they did it politically. Um, I mean, they weren't going to do what other people their age had done. They were going to take a different line altogether. There's a lot of very very ideological fervor in Washington at that, in that period. And all those people then turned up in think tanks. Well, Dinesh D'Souza bought, writes a book. It's going to be bought by all those people in think tanks, right? <laughs> at the American Enterprise Institute, the Heritage Foundation. It's going to, <laughs> that's, there's a certain built-in sale on those books. Well, there's a built-in audience. It yeah. is interesting, though. You, you demonstrate uh, in your chapter on, on D'Souza's work on Reagan that Nevertheless, the book was not subjected to any genuine critical scrutiny no. by the working press, by reviewers. No. no. And does that strike you as something new in American public life, or do you think this is just a, well, I think the same that, way of doing things? I, no, I think that it is new. I, 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 th I think that um, uh, in some ways the critical faculty has been Law, the critical reading faculty has has been atrophied in in some way. I don't know how or why. Well, there's obviously the the business pressures in publishing, mm -hmm. and in fact, in the journalistic world. Now, in the journalistic world, that too, that yeah. make objective news gathering, if there ever was such a thing, and sort of critical analysis of of information, more and more difficult. Well, there's a, there, I mean, as, as, as journalistically. It's uh, if you need sources. I mean, if you, if, if as as reporters tend to need sources, right? If you need sources in Washington, uh, you are not going to get have those sources if unless you write the kinds of stories that they want to see written. You are not going to have your phone calls. And there was there was a. Something, Ari Fleischer was quoted recently, I mean, I, I just something I read over the weekend, having said to somebody uh, in a press conference, uh, uh, his, just his daily noon briefing, and uh, a reporter asked a question, and uh, he didn't like the question, and, and what he said was, uh, uh, something like, uh, that has been, no your attitude on that has been noted in the building. <laughs> well, but that, but that does raise an interesting point. I mean, it, many of us remember uh, the fairly pugnacious relations between the press and the White House in the 1960s, the height of the protests over the Vietnam War. There's that celebrated uh, interchange between President Nixon and Dan Rather, mm -hmm. probably made Dan Rather's career when mm -hmm. the president asked Rather if he was running for something. And, Rather's retort, no, Mr. President, are you? Uh, uh, <laughs> these were clearly not years in which the press core, certainly the White House press core, and uh, the, the administration itself had cordial, cordial relations or open lines of communication. And yet, when we look at the biographies or political histories of earlier presidential administrations, we learn that there was always an effort to manipulate, even intimidate, the press. I mean, evidently, Franklin Roosevelt's White House was quite adroit at this, threatening credentials, uh, making clear to reporters that if they reported something that the White House was unhappy with, they would find themselves stopped. At but, the it didn't, but, but it didn't. But, 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 but it, it did not have the have the, have the cowing effect that it seems to have. It apparently, does now. Yeah. yeah. Do you think that has something to do, again, with these business pressures of the, essentially, the firms that these reporters now represent? I think it could, yeah. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't, 
I don't know. I, 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 I think that, I think what it has to do with, in a, in, 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 in a, in a real way too, is, is these reporters, ever since Woodward Bernstein, um, who were, They they, 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 they they want to be inside. Now, in fact, Woodward and Bernstein were not, at that time they did Watergate, they were not insiders. They um, were Metro reporters who, scrappy kids, um, with no inside at all. That's how they did it. Um, but then they became stars and they became insiders uh, as a result of Watergate. And a lot of people coming into journalism saw that as, uh, they, they got the stardom part. So they become victimized by their own success. Yeah, and they, and, and they like the ins, that, that, ins, that sense of being inside and, 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 and they're flattered by sort of one-on-one -on -one talks with the candidate, you know. Uh. Well, you're fairly critical of some colleagues in the journalistic field, Woodward included, in, in, in one of your essays, especially his conduct around the uh, Lewinsky scandals that plagued uh, the Clinton administration. Uh, and Michael Isikoff of the Washington Post uh, feels the sharp <laughs> wit of your pen. Now. There, there used to be an expectation that working journalists, if not through their formal training in a journalism program, then certainly through their experience, you know, as cub reporters and so forth, and making their ways up, would learn about the ethics of their trade. And there was some commitment to the notion that they were first and foremost public servants, because they were out there to collect objective information. Because they're out there to, to, to find out what's happening. That's right. right. And, and to get it verified and, and, and so forth. Um, you don't speak directly to this in your essays, but you seem to be making general statements about, well, call it, call it what it is, the decline of journalism as a professional enterprise well, I, in yeah, contemporary I, I, America. It, 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 and it declined as a professional enterprise, it seems to me, even as it, 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 it declined into professionalism. Um, I mean, I don't think you have to go to journalism school to uh, Learn, you know. I mean, you can learn how to write a news story in about an hour and a half. You know, I mean, by by writing one, and then then somebody edits it, and then you know how to do it, right? Uh, who, what, where, when? <laughs> I mean, how? Um, it. What what they? I don't. There is there's a kind of mumbo jumbo now about about uh, and what the, what has gotten lost is just the sense of. Is, is any deep commitment to, to seeing what's happening that isn't what a source told you, uh, to sort of looking at uh, a commitment to being outside, outside the story. But for, but for many years, at least throughout much of the 20th century, and then with growing regulation of media, uh, in the wake of World War II, there had been an effort to sort of erect firewalls between mm -hmm. the journalistic or news gathering enterprise in a television station or at a newspaper or a radio station and the commercial side yeah. of the enterprise. But now those things seem to, that firewall seems to have been removed. These things are conflated. Uh, we speak of infotainment yeah. rather than of news. Yeah, I think it's, that's, it's, 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 that's very pronounced uh, on uh, on, on some television, in some, uh, in a lot of television. Uh, Not to mention, you often get the the problem then of the same corporate entity that's producing the news has published Dinesh D'Souza or some yeah. pundit, so they're going to frame that work in a particular yeah. way, yeah. rather I mean, than report we, on the, the facts. The firewalls are still there in a in, in, in an obvious in the obvious ways. I mean, look at what happened at the Los Angeles Times after the, the, the Staples Center. Uh, you may not have followed this, but the then publisher of the Los Angeles Times um, and his, his um, second-in-command decided to 
um, sell a huge, I don't know, they did, a, they did a kind of package deal with the Staples Center and it included a lot of coverage, right? Um, but it, this was not known to the editorial staff and when they, it, 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 it led eventually to the, to, to the publisher uh, being uh, let go by the Chandlers. Um, and eventually, I suppose, it led to the sale of the paper and et cetera. But th that's a very obvious kind of thing. You of know, crossing the line. Of that's crossing the line, yeah. yeah. Uh, it, it happens all the time in, in more subtle ways, I think. And in ways that are invisible to, to us. us, the, the yeah. reading public, the yeah. consumer. Uh, speaking of political fictions, let's talk about another one, uh, Newt Gingrich. Um, <laughs> You, uh, you have a wonderful chapter on uh, Newt Gingrich, superstar. Um, uh, and I know that among historians, we've, we've noted ruefully that he received a PhD in our discipline <laughs> from yes. Tulane University. So yeah. there's no telling what damage a PhD in our discipline can do. Have you, uh, ever, watched his, have you ever watched his videos? The, the the canned videos, yes. Yeah, they're, they're astonishing. They're they're astonishing. <laughs> yes, that's a polite word. Um, as I recall, he he was a course. I mean, he taught he, he taught video courses yeah. and sold them. He he evidently wrote a dissertation on, um, I believe it was Belgian imperialism in Africa. That's right. I have, a, cop I have a, was, I have a copy of this. Uh, arguing that it was a good <laughs> thing. It yes. was a, a benefit to the people of Africa. Um, <laughs> Well, again, you're, you're singling him out for dissection well, the, in that chapter. At the time I did that, uh, 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 that, that piece, it, uh, it was, he was still, you know, still very much with us. <laughs> right, right. Well, he was sort of like a meteor. He shot across the sky and then disappeared. Uh, here he was, the Speaker of the House who would foment a revolution, uh, the compact with America. Um, but I, 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 I still thought he was interest. I mean, he was he was interest, interesting in that that in that the that whole everything that drove him. I mean, all of the whole contract for America. We we still have the fallout from that. Well, you describe him in this chapter as uh, I'm using your words a leading beneficiary of the nation's cultural and historical amnesia. Want to talk a little bit about about that? Um, well, I mean, I can't even I think on how many levels uh, he <laughs> benefited from this. But uh, I mean, the obvious one is 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 uh, everything he said w had no relation to anything that was. Or had he had no concept? He had no concept of history. He had no concept of, 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 of. I mean, it was it was it was just kind of astonishing. <laughs> no facts. No, no facts. No verifiable. No, he had, what he had was uh, he had principles. Uh, I mean, he talked about it about about you know there were it was like ten it was like ten ten. Um, Ways to more effective leadership, or something, and in fact, effective leadership was one of his one of one of his principles. Uh, you and, and you had always they were always numbered. Uh, you had uh, five pillars of uh, wisdom, five pillars of uh, American history, and then if you actually tried to track them through, you would find yourself lost because they didn't. He he, he himself would lose track. Uh, yes. Well, and there's also the irony of the yes, he made. He, in in uh, much of his writings and in some of these videos, he talked a lot about the importance of leadership as an historical force. He certainly subscribed to a kind of big person, big person theory yeah. of yeah. Uh, American history and its virtues. And yet, he ultimately proved himself to be one of the most ineffective speakers in the history of the Congress. I mean, he couldn't get a laundry list passed through the Congress. No. Uh, so, how do we account then for the fact that at the time of his ascendancy, of course, he's gone from the scene now, Lord knows where he is, um, there seemed to be very little genuine criticism of all of these weaknesses or incongruities in what he had to say. Or, or no, I, and I'm not sure anybody read him uh, or listened or watched or, or I mean, it was, it, it, it was astonishing. He, I mean, he was, he was, he, he was taken at his own face value as, 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 as sort of, 
the way he thought of himself was as the as a revolutionary, uh, a, a a new Republican revolutionary, and that was pretty much how he was how he was received in, in you know in, in by the press. Do you think there's been a, a an asymmetry in the way? A Republican leader like Newt Gingrich in his day as Speaker of the House have been treated uh, in public by the press, by commentators, and, and Democrats? This has been a, com a common complaint from the Democratic Party, right? That they're not, they're not being treated with the same standards that evidently uh, a Teflon president like Reagan or Newt Gingrich was treated in their day. Uh, I think or do you think that's just whining? No, I think to some extent, um, I, I think to some extent, uh, most reporters are Democrats. Um, just, it's, I mean, it's just a, it, it's just the way things are. And I think they are particularly, uh, and, and, and sort of reflexively, um, uh, careful about giving a break to the other side. I also think they don't understand Republicans. I don't think they understand, they don't seem to understand the way they talk or the way, I mean, I, I'm astonished by the way, by, by what I read about what George Bush has said. I mean, uh, uh, for example, after he um, spoke to the United Nations. One of the things he said to the United Nations was, um, uh, at the, in the United Nations speech, uh, we, uh, we will have allies, we will, uh, there, we will have people at our side, etc. And this was interpreted afterwards as, as meaning um, that he had softened his position and he was going to not make a move until, with, until he had the UN on his side. That's not what he meant at all. He meant, what he meant was that he, I mean, who defines the allies? He does. Um, so uh, he's got Tony Blair, that's, uh, that's the ally. <laughs> but I mean, that, that, uh, that, that, I mean, it's a very common way of talking uh, among people in business. <laughs> this, and he, well, I think he a lot was just of, utilizing the same vocabulary yes. now brought to the yeah, high political yeah. world. That's an interesting point you, you raise about the inability of what is arguably a democratically inclined, mm -hmm. in the sense of party politics, a democratically inclined press and the difficulties in interpreting a Republican leadership. You have rather unique credentials in this regard, and I'm, I, I can't resist asking you. You make clear in, in the book that your roots are Republican roots. Yeah. Grew up in Northern California uh, in a Republican uh, household. You described yourself as an ardent supporter of Barry Goldwater, right. uh, uh, who certainly by today's current standards uh, appears to be a giant among uh, political mean, yeah. leaders. <laughs> um, and, you know, full disclosure, I was raised in a Democratic Party household, you know. Franklin Roosevelt was God, Robert Taft was the devil, you know, and so on. Just, and so just, I'm curious. Just the opposite. You see. <laughs> right. uh, I was taught Republicans are fat and happy, you know. Now, you clearly are neither. So the question is, <laughs> the, the question is, how do you... How do you account for this rather special, you know, personal odyssey, political odyssey, where you, you have a clear understanding of Republican Party roots, history, I mean, that animates much of your discussion in these essays, and yet you're very critical well, of the I think party. Well, I think the party went in a whole other direction. I mean, I think the Republican Party doesn't bear any relationship to the Republican Party of my childhood, um, which was basically at least uh, for California Republicans, it had a, it, it was very, very. Um, the basic thing was stay out of my life. Uh, I mean, to the, I mean, it was it had nothing. It was it was small government to keep the government out of out of your life. Um, Obviously, that's not what the Republican Party stands for anymore. I was about to say, yes, keep government at bay, but also relatively quiet on social and cultural issues. Totally quiet, yeah. For similar reasons. Right? Yes, private that's, matters. they're private matters. 
It had, they had, I don't remember the Republican Party having any, any of those social issues it, um, that now dominate it. Well, we have to talk about the Lewinsky scandal. <laughs> speaking uh, of social issues. Speaking <laughs> of social and cultural yeah. issues. Uh, you have a, a uh, remarkable chapter in the book which you wonderfully titled Vichy Washington. Uh, and you talk about not only the, the scandal itself involving President Clinton and uh, how this undercut uh, his administration, but also in particular how the press handled the scandal, how the political insiders, who are your core subject in this volume, uh, handled uh, the scandal. Do you think that this was really an, uh, an attempt at a kind of coup? I think it, I think it was, yeah. Um, 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 you know, everybody jumped all over Hillary Clinton when she said it was a vast right-wing conspiracy. Maybe it wasn't vast, uh, but the, and maybe you don't. Well, maybe conspiracy is the wrong word. But there was, there had been an attempt to get Clinton uh, by the right wing from the day he was elected. And I mean, the, uh, the, the question of impeachment did not, by any means, come up when it finally happened, or, or with Monica Lewinsky, it, it had come up practically again from, from the inauguration. There, there, were, there were people giving speeches uh, about the necessity for impeaching and the, and the grounds on which uh, he could be impeached. Uh, so there was this real, some people seem, I mean this is one of those mysteries in life, some people some people get some people get hated a lot. Uh, Roosevelt did. Uh, he he incited that kind of um, and that profound likes and dislikes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And Clinton, for some reason, was one of those one of those polarizing personalities. Um, so, well, I think there was. I mean, the, the the idea of using the legal system to basically entrap him here. I mean, I, 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 saw, I, I saw it as, as an entrapment case. Well, you make clear throughout the chapter, I mean, you constantly refer back to all of the available data that the public was either unconcerned by the scandal, felt it was a diversion to invest so much time and energy in it, uh, felt it was unfair, felt it was none of their business, you know, any combination, and certainly felt that none of the issues that were raised in this so-called scandal addressed the leading political, leading political concerns in their own lives, right. health care, education, right. and so yeah. forth. And yet, the political handlers uh, in Washington, your insiders, and journalists wouldn't let this thing go. Well, it did, uh, you see, it, it, it could be, it, it was, Useful in that it allowed it allowed um, these social issues to come for uh, to come to come to come front and center, and those social issues are very important to what they consider their key constituency. Uh, it, it's, it's again that tiny group of people who vote in primaries. Um, so it was. It, it, I think there was a political. Uh, they saw a political usefulness there. So that this scandal would then define a focus group right. that could be a lever in the election. Yeah. I see. Yeah. <laughs> At the same time, uh, the scandal seemed to frame some genuine areas of contestation between the major parties up on the Hill. I mean, the whole debate about reproductive choice, about the role of women in American society, families, uh, gay rights, and so forth. This all always seemed to be lurking in the background, mm -hmm. and certainly seemed to galvanize the major protagonists in this debate between the Clinton White House and, mm -hmm. and the Republican leadership yeah. determined to impeach. Yeah. I mean, I... But yet that debate was never joined. No. I mean, these things were never made vivid. No. Uh, I mean, I remember it, 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 it was kind of seized on by people like Robert Bork um, as the means by which the country would be, re, would be cleansed or morally rearmed. Um, I mean, there were, the, the, the notion of moral rearmament was very much with us that year. I mean, William Bennett was talking about it. Uh, he always talks about yeah, it. Yeah. Um, 
and then Borg uh, had there were four things that he thought that uh, could possibly save America from itself, and one you know one was one was uh, a spiritual rebirth, which you could presumably get through through casting out Monica Lewinsky and the and, and the errant president, um, and or and or uh, a war or economic depression. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this would be cleansing. Cleansing, yes, yeah, and, and and could could, could rearm America. Well, and it's interesting, you go on uh, in your final chapter to show how these themes of moral rearmament, the need to sort of cleanse the filth out of the uh, Oval Office and so forth, uh, that this carried uh, onward into the presidential campaign, mm -hmm. where Al Gore... And, and it's crippled it, yes. Yes, yeah. and he felt possessed to yeah. uh, uh, seize upon Joe Lieberman yeah. as his moral compass. Yeah. Uh, uh, to sort of demonstrate to the American people that the Democratic Party could be uh, could, could be just as, as as virtuous as as now he he he, he I, I don't I mean it was a nutty campaign I mean it was and yet his own party picked on him every single time he went away from it if you remember it, right after Labor Day he started he raised some populist issues right. Uh, moved a bit to the left moved a bit of the standard uh, and, and was accused of throwing away the election on this ground, right? Um, I mean, it was, it was a weird... Well, but do you think, given the scandals that surrounded the election and the whole problem with the Florida vote, mm -hmm. uh, there are some, now they may very well be part of the insider class, you know, who are your target in these essays, but there are some who argue the Democratic strategy worked. But the election was stolen from that. That that Gore and Gore and Lieberman actually did win. It, should, it shouldn't have been that close, though. You know, um, I mean, we had there was no reason for it to be that close. We 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 were, um, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> right. It it, it, yeah. it couldn't be that effective a strategy yeah. if it left it uh, uh, as so fine an issue. Let me take a few minutes actually just to talk with you about your your career as a writer. Mm -hmm. Uh, we're a reading public here, we're fascinated, and we uh, adore our writers. And I think everyone is always curious about how writers go about their business. How do you do it? Uh, literally, how do, you, how do you find the focus? How do you find the discipline? Oh, uh, how do you frame your days when you're engrossed in a, in a work like this? Well, I mean, until you, until you do find the focus, uh, it's just, just really really hard work and very dispiriting. Um, I mean, for example, one of those pieces, um, the first of those, those Clinton pieces uh, started out, or actually, no, not the Clinton pieces, what became the, the piece about the uh, compassionate conservatism and the moral stuff <laughs> about the Bush, cam Bush Gore campaign. I started out, I was going to examine the Bush can the, the 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 Bush what what, it, what the Bush foreign policy right what the people around Bush during the campaign thought in terms of foreign policy uh, so I read through all these papers by Condoleezza Rice and all these and you know there was some interesting stuff but you couldn't quite it seemed unlikely at that moment that. Um, that it was all going to come together as a cohesive foreign policy. There was nothing, by the way, about about preemptive strikes. <laughs> nothing about Iraq. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, in fact, there some place there a couple of them were talking about uh, uh, lifting the, the the embargo of Cuba. I mean, it was it was all fairly. It, it, it didn't quite. You couldn't see, think that that was really going to happen unless. But maybe you know. So I. But after, while I was going through all this stuff, Bob Silvers at the New York Review had sent me, just with a bunch of other books, he had sent me this book by Marvin Olasky. And I started reading it, and so then, then I got more interested in that and, and went and started talking about compassionate conservatism. So, it, I mean, it, 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 it takes a long time to focus in. To, to find those topics. Yeah. Once you do engage with material, when you, when you mark out your terrain, uh, 
is it is it your practice to sort of write in a white heat and just start and keep going till you're done, or is it a sort of day by day, bit by bit process, or is oh, it not critical no, at all? No, it's day by day, bit by bit, because uh, the whole meaning of anything for me is in the is in is in the grammar. I mean, it doesn't mean anything until I've written it. So I don't have I don't have a lot of thoughts. You know, uh, they don't they don't form <laughs> uh, until I've written it down. So. So it's really, uh, so the process of writing is the process of thinking. And clearly, it, what's always very clear in your essays is there's clearly a lot of preparation. I mean, you're doing a lot of homework. I know that several of your, several of your reviewers have said recently about, about this very book and uh, some of the other essay work that led to it, they said, this is astonishing. Here's a writer who's actually read Dinesh D'Souza, Newt Gingrich, you know, well, and the rest it, of them page Isn't it surprising that that's surprising? <laughs> <laughs> well, it sort of goes back to this whole discussion of just what journalists yeah. and others are up to. Yeah. They pontificate on an array of issues, but they clearly haven't done the homework, the yeah. preparation to, to speak with precision about some yeah. of these issues. Well, you know, I was an English major at Berkeley, and uh, it was during the time they were doing new criticism there then. So I learned all that backwards and forwards, all that close textual analysis. <laughs> yes. And don't talk about the context right. at all. You know, yeah. Right. So, so I still go to the text. Well, we have a we have a few minutes left. Uh, none of us can none of us can avoid the opportunity of of asking a, a contemporary political analyst about the current situation and what weighs heavily on everyone's minds about the possibility of war overseas what the current administration uh, is up to, uh, and to the extent you are connected in this world of, of political analysts and, and commentators. Um, do you think it's fair to, re to regard the, the posturing of the Bush administration in the past few weeks as a kind of wag the dog syndrome? Is, is the president trying to simply reap domestic benefits out of a, out of a foreign policy adventure? I know, I, 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 I... I, I don't think it's straightforward that, but I think that certainly it had, that there's an element there, and I also think that there's the, the, the fact that Al Qaeda has not well, that, that 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 who knows what, where we are in that uh, not we're not where we where where the president said we would be, and. It, there's a, I, there, I can't avoid thinking that there's an element of pulling down a new scrim, you know. Uh, you slate, yeah. sort of like an etch-a-sketch, you know, yeah. you shake it and it goes blank. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's, I mean, I think there are a lot of, there are a lot of things at work here. Um, but whatever, what, they all, what they all add up to feels like the, big, like the days before World War I. Um, I mean, it has that kind of inexorable drift toward... Um, and yet, with, it's interesting you choose World War I as an example, since it's at least in the, in the days leading up to not only the start of that war, but ultimately U.S. involvement in that war. There didn't seem to be a lot of discussion about war aims, mm -hmm. unlike World War II, for example. It seems right. well, that the, was, the record yeah. shows the Roosevelt government went to yeah. great lengths to firmly articulate mm -hmm. goals and, and, and strategies. Mm -hmm. uh, there doesn't seem to be much discussion about, I mean, we hear this phrase regime, regime change. Regime change, yes. But what, to, to what, yes. It doesn't and seem to have a lot of substance. Then we hear about weapons of mass, and then immediately if you would question regime change, uh, we hear weapons of mass destruction. And it, and it, 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 we, we, the, None of these things seem to uh, seem to. There doesn't seem to be. be I mean, the, the the attempt to 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 put to make the case w did not seem to me to. It was not an argued case. You know, it was just a repetition of those phrases. And, and you've also just offered the very interesting observation about Al Qaeda that where we are in this effort. Yes. Well, where where do we want to be? Well. Uh, where the president wanted to be was dead or alive, right? Uh, that's not the case. <laughs> alive, <laughs> but not us. Um, they, and and it was a it was a badly defined. I mean, I think it, you know it was very popular probably at the moment he said it. I mean, it, it, 
fit the mood of the country in a in a in a way probably but it it was always a wrong a wrong definition because it wasn't we weren't talking about one man ever um, we were talking about something else we were talking about I mean all something that had to be that if you got rid of one man you were not going to get rid of the problem uh, and it, had, it did have a context which we preferred not to I mean it's you still hear the you still hear people in the administration talking about terrorism as if it were some kind of freak of, of nature that just sprang, a sport of nature that just sprang up out of the nowhere, right? And not a political technique uh, or tactic, and not, and not uh, usually coming into play in, in context. And if you try to say something like that, it is generally written off as uh, not, it, Early in the early days, it was written off as not patriotic, like what happened to Susan Sant. Susan, Susan got saw Sontag got very beaten up for saying that this had a context, right? right. <laughs> um, or later, that it was it was a little the, the response was a little more nuanced, but to the same thing. It was it was it was you had been ta it, it was you the speaker had been taken in by. Um, um, uh, the, the, by the, the, the they 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 do this because they live in poverty. Uh, uh, right. You've been duped. Yeah, you've been, been, been duped. Yeah, yeah. As a typical liberal. Yeah. Joan Didion, thank you very much for joining us this evening. <laughs>